السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده تعالى ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما مزيدا My dear brothers and sisters in Islam about a year and a half ago I received a small video clip on WhatsApp and normally these video clips I don't honestly watch them but I received this from one of my colleagues who I had studied with in Medina, who is a young scholar of Islam. And usually, mashallah, what he sends is beneficial. So I opened up this video and I started to watch this video. And it was talking about a Muslim commander who on the battlefield had won more than 50 battles against the enemies of Islam with zero defeats. He had never been defeated. And how when he finally died, all of Europe celebrated his death and they came to celebrate on top of his grave. And I sat and thought to myself, yes, yeah, subhanAllah. We know Floyd Money Mayweather in the boxing world who's 50 and 0. But as Muslims, here we have this Muslim hero who went more than 50 and 0, never lost. But yet we've never heard of him, subhanAllah. Who is this commander, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to mention in this khutbah. Later, as I was lecturing in the Gulf countries, and we saw the phenomena of this new Turkish film, and we saw the advertisements for it, Ortogul. And I assumed this was some fictional character they made a movie about. Like many Muslims, I had never heard of him. So when I went online and I did my research and I found subhanAllah, even though much of the information in the film is not authentic, it's fictional. But the origin of the story is true. The individual, a man with small numbers who strove, who strove to implement Islam and to establish justice on earth. He was the core of one of the greatest empires known to mankind. His son Uthman, the founder of the Ottoman Empire. And yet, most Muslims never even heard of him. Allah Akbar. I remember then, when I was in Medina and I was a student, and we were studying the battles of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's one author who wrote in detail about the battles of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was a former Iraqi general, Mahmoud Sheet Khattab, rahimahullah. And how he got into learning about the battles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and of the companions, he said that he was sent from the Iraqi government to study a course in Germany. And he said, as we're sitting there, Iraqi, Arab, Muslims, preparing for the lecture of the day, the lecturer came in, the German officer, and he said, today we're going to learn about the history and the war strategies of Khalid ibn Walid. Allah Akbar. He said, subhanAllah, he said, we are Muslims, we're Arabs, and we don't even study in our, in our, in our, in our schools about Khalid ibn Walid in detail. And here, the Westerners who knew the status of this man, they're studying his history. So why don't we know about our own history? Why are we so ignorant? when it comes to our own history. There's a lot of reasons and a lot of objectives why we are blocked from learning our history. But what is significant is that it's not just a mere coincidence, the fact that the Muslims have become so ignorant with their history. Because what happens when a Muslim looks into his history, he sees not just the success that the Muslims had on the battlefield, but even when it comes to science and inventions, 
during the time of the Golden Era, which in the West they called the Dark Ages, which in reality was the Golden Ages. And some brothers want to dispute with them, no, actually it was gold, no, it was dark. Yeah, Juan, for them it was dark, it's true. In their history, it was their Dark Ages. But when you look at the inventions, many of the modern inventions that we have today, whether it be from the clocks or from the cameras, all the origins of these were laid down by Muslim scientists, Muslim inventors. Many of the surgical tools that surgeons use in operations even today by Muslim doctors. Modern day universities, the first ones established, go on Google, they'll tell you, it was one of ours in Italy. We established it first. Allah Akbar. The reality is when you do the research, even some of them admit it. In Morocco, in Fas, by Fatima al-Fihri, who was the first one to establish the first ever known university, established by a woman, run by a woman, almost a thousand years before women in America and the West received proper educational rights. When you look at modern aviation, the foundations were laid down by Abbas ibn Farnas, way before the Wright brothers. When you look at cleanliness, compare Europe during that time and compare the Muslims and how much of we know of a personal hygiene was taken from the Muslims, from perfumes, from soaps, all of this. Look at modern day maps. Go back in history, who were the first people to make paper maps in the 8th century, the Muslims in Baghdad. Who was the first one to discover America? Columbus? Then why is it on the Muslim maps way before he got lost and found America? The Muslims knew about it. It's on the maps. It's detailed. All of this stuff we have in our history, algebra, even the coffee that millions, billions of people drink daily, discovered by the Muslims. All of these things compare the civilization of the Muslim of the non-Muslims throughout history. Compare when the Muslim conquerors would conquer a land and how they would establish justice in these lands and how they would be fair, not just to the Muslims, but even to the non-Muslims who resided in those lands. And then look at the Christian invaders when they invaded countries and how they did to the people of those countries when they invaded. And look at the modern crusaders when they came to colonize, as they said, the countries. And look what they did to the people of these countries. This is modern history in front of us. The information is right there. Compare the difference of the two. And that's why when a Muslim looks into his history, he realizes that the success of my ummah in the past was when they were what? True Muslims, when they implemented Islam. Allah honored them. Allah rose, raised, he, he, he rose their status when it was in the affairs of the deen and the affairs of the dunya. He raised their status in the affairs of the deen and the affairs of the dunya. This is when they were true Muslims. And that's why Umar al-Khattab used to say, نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ أَعَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ that we are a nation. Allah honored us with Islam. But when we look for honor and other than Islam, Allah humiliates us. And this is the reality of the Ummah today. And that's why Imam Malik, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said that the end of this Ummah will not rectify its situation except for what rectified the first part of this Ummah. That which fixed the first part of this Ummah. That's what's going to fix the later part of it as well. That's the only thing that we have that's going to make us successful. That's the only thing that's made us successful all throughout our history is when we held firm to our Islam. When we had true Islamic principles in our hearts and in our actions. Unfortunately, when we look at the history that we're taught today, spoon-fed history of a Western or non-Muslim narrative, glorifying many parts of their history and hiding and denying some of the gruesome facts of their history and distorting parts of our history and hiding it from us. When you look, for example, at the great Sahabi Amr ibn Al-As and the justice he 
implement it when he conquered Egypt. And they make him to be out in their history as some type of war criminal. A'udhu Billah. But they come to a true war criminal. And Napoleon, their hero, and they glorify him. Even though Napoleon, 140 years, 140 years before Hitler and the Nazis did their genocide in the gas chambers, he did the same thing during the Haiti Revolution. He was the first one to use these gas chambers. But yet he's glorified as a leader and as this and that in the West. And they deny some of the facts. Some research that says he killed up to 100,000 black slaves. They deny these numbers and they reject them. But nonetheless, it doesn't matter about the numbers. It doesn't matter about the numbers. He was an evil person, a corrupter, but yet he's glorified in the history. And you come to someone like Suleiman al-Qanuni, Suleiman the Magnificent, and they make him out to be some type of womanizer in order to distort this great sultan and all of the great things that he established. So the Muslims don't know who he was and how to benefit from their own history. SubhanAllah, even in Hollywood, when you look at things in the cartoons or in the movies, and they make out things and they distort things, that famous pirate that we always seen since we were young kids, young bacha, huh? And we see the red beard pirate, this evil, bloodthirsty criminal pirate. We see him in the movies and we see him in the cartoons. In reality, who was this individual? He was a Muslim hero. A Muslim hero from Albania who was put in charge by the Khalifa of the Ottoman Empire, Salim al Awwal, Salim the First, to rescue, to rescue the Muslims who were trapped in being tortured in the, in the dungeons of the Catholic Church in Indulus. After they were captured in Indulus, they were put in these dungeons and they were tortured day and night. So the Khalifa of the Muslims sent this great Muslim soldier on his ship to go in on missions. Missions to save Muslims, wallahi, like it's a scene right out of a Hollywood movie. But this was the reality and the bravery of the Muslims. But yet it's distorted to make him out to be some type of bloodthirsty criminal. When you look at the Hollywood movies, and many of our children, and many of the adults as well, we glorify these scenes of these action heroes and these action movies. When you look into our history, you find that Islam, we have these real-life superheroes. We have these real-life action stories in our own history. Look at the story of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh, and his battles against Amr ibn Abud, the one who was Amr ibn Abud, who was the great warrior during the Battle of Al Khandaq, who everyone was scared to battle, who was never defeated on the battlefield. He said, who will come out to fight me? Right away, who stood up without any hesitation? Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh. He went and he defeated him. And that was the opening of the battle for the Muslims. During the Battle of Khaybar, his story with Marhab al-Yahudi as well. The stories of Khalid ibn Walid and all his heroics on the battlefield. Radiallahu anh. The great Sahabi, Al-Barab al-Malik. During the Battle of Yamama, when... Musaylam al-Kadhab and his troops, they retreated into their fortress. And the Muslims couldn't get in. Al-Bara was known to be very skinny. He was very small, but he was a lion in his heart, radiallahu anh. He told the other Sahaba, put me up on the shield, lift me up. I'll jump over the wall and open the door. They say, you're going to be killed. The soldiers are right there. He said, at least let me try. If I open the door, it's a... Nasr, it's a victory. If I get killed, it's just shihad, alhamdulillah, it's all good. They lifted him up, put him up on the wall. He goes inside, kills 10 of the soldiers by himself. And as he's trying to open the door, he gets stabbed and sliced over 80 times until he opened the door. But he didn't die, radiallahu anhu. But look at the heroic stances, like something from a scene of a movie. When you look at the conquering of Testur, when... The Muslims came and surrounded this great Persian fortress. And inside of it was more than 150,000 Persian soldiers. And the Muslims were 30,000. 
And they would send out small units to fight the Muslims, thinking they would defeat them. They had the numbers. They had their first battle, second, third, fourth. How many battles? 80 battles. The Muslims won every single battle, 80 and 0. They defeated them every time. But yet they couldn't get inside to conquer the building, to conquer the fortress. Until they learned after 18 months, after 18 months of a siege around the fortress, they learned about secret entrances from the bottom. And after they had a party for one of the commanders who got married and they were all drunk, before Salat al-Fajr, the Sahaba came in from under the water, came out throughout the waterfalls and through under the ground, and they attacked and they opened it up, and they were victorious. And it's something like the scene of a movie. We know the, what happened in Mission Impossible. We all know these, these type of movies. But what happened in our own history, real stories from our own history. SubhanAllah, we don't, know, we don't know about these things. When you look in history, people look at the reformers, freedom fighters, Look at, for example, Malcolm X. Alhamdulillah, Malcolm X accepted Islam. But if you look at the examples of Che Guevara or these type of people, which many people idolize, the first one to establish guerrilla warfare, and he's a freedom fighter, not knowing that who he learned this warfare from was from a Muslim. Al Amir Muhammad ibn Abdul Karim al Khattabi, rahimahullah, who was the first one to establish this type of, of warfare. And we look at Chi Kavara as a freedom fighter, when in reality, if you look at his history, he was more of a war criminal. But Al Amir Muhammad ibn Abdul Karim al Khattabi, rahimahullah, was a true freedom fighter who fought against the French armies who invaded his country for freedom and for justice of his people and to establish justice. And yet, this is our history, but we don't know about it. Wallahu musta'an. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن والسنة ونفعني وياكم بما فيهما من الآية والحكمة أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم بسم الله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على نبي المصطفى وبعد ما dear brothers and sisters we mentioned in the beginning of the khutbah the great Muslim commander who in his battles went with over 50 victories and zero defeats, more than 50 and 0. But yet many of us have never even heard his name. He was the ruler of Indulus for about 24 years. Al-Hajib al-Mansur, Muhammad ibn Abi Amir, rahimahullah ta'ala. A name that perhaps many of us never heard of. But as we said, when he died, there were celebrations throughout the streets of Europe. A Muslim commander who never lost. Every time he went to battle, he was victorious. And at the end of every battle, he ordered that the Adhan be called out. And he would go to his garments and he would take the dirt and the dust from it and put it in a small bottle. And he gathered all of it up from all of the battles. And he told his troops, he said, if I die, bury these bottles with me. I want them to testify me for me, Yom al Qiyamah, all the battles I went through. Dirt from all the battles he was victorious in. His one wish was that he died in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not behind the walls of, of the castles. He was a leader, he could have been in his castle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him his wish. And he died in the path to battle when he was going to conquer the south of France. They came to celebrate on his grave, thinking that now they were victorious. Finally, they've defeated. And so one of them said, and brought to their attention that the reality is that the one under the grave, he's victorious. We were never able to get the upper hand on him until he was put into his grave. So this is a victory for him, subhanAllah. This was the reality of our ummah when they followed Islam. They excelled in all aspects. As we said, not just on the battlefield. These are amazing stories. But when it came to science, when it came to inventions, when you look at the rich Islamic history and Islamic sciences, you'll never find that there's more books written in any field more than Islamic sciences. Look at the Library of Congress in America. You'll find that the most books are Islamic books. 
written about Islam. That shows you the detail of our scholars. My dear brothers and sisters, why is it so important that we study history? What do we gain? What is the power of history? First of all, we see the success stories of those who were before us. And we benefit from all they have to offer. Not all that is modern is actually better. Many examples in modern history, you can see 20, 40, 50, 100 years ago, where the situation is actually better than it was today. So we can benefit from these things in our lives. We can look at the success stories. How did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is our problem when we study seerah, we study the history, why we don't truly benefit, we study as ma'lumat, just information, just gather information. But when we study it, look at these success stories. 23 years. How was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam able to make such a change and have such a huge success in this short amount of time? What did he do alayhi salatu wa salam? This is how we look into the seerah. When we look into the sahaba radiallahu anhum, how were they able to be so successful and conquer all of these lands and do all of these things? We have to look into what made them successful. We look into later history. Muhammad al-Fatih rahimahullah ta'ala. All throughout history they tried to conquer al qustantaniya but they weren't successful. What made him successful? What did he do that was different? Look into the success. Even when it comes to other nations as well, non-Muslims, we can benefit when we look into history. Look into recent history. Nelson Mandela, for example. 27 years in prison. How many of us would have given up on our mission? How many of us would have given up on our vision? But he stayed firm. And look at the situation he was in. Very difficult. 27 years. But later he was successful. And he completed what he wanted to complete. If you look even in to a huge success story, in recent history, the Irish Americans, and I don't say that because I'm from them, but if you look into Irish Americans and the difficulties that they faced when they came to America in the 1850s, where they were looked at like the former slaves, the same level. When they wanted to get a job, it said, help needed, no need for black or Irish to apply. You can see the signs even to today. They went through difficulties, but when you read about their history, they said, by, the ninth, by 1900, 50 years later, they became equivalent to all of the other whites in America. By 1950, they, they became the superior race in America, meaning they run the show, even till today. But this is something we can look into. What may, how, how could, a, as a Muslim minority in the West, as a Muslim minority in India, wherever we are, what made this group successful 100 years? Let's benefit. What did they do? We can benefit from some of the same things. This is the power and the benefit of history. Also, it shows us and teaches us to stay away from the mistakes that were made throughout history. If you look at the Ottoman Empire, for example, 600 years, huge success in the empire. But what were the reasons, for example, of the downfall? And when we look into this, it doesn't have to be as a nation or a country that benefits from this. Us as individuals, the same mistakes that they made, we can stay away from as individuals to make sure we don't fall into the same traps and the same mistakes as well. As I said, my dear brothers and sisters, we need to revive in ourselves, in our household, in our ummah, knowing our history, knowing the heroes of Islam that we have and all of the different sciences, all of the different commanders, all of the different scholars, knowing the, 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 the beautiful history that we have in order to revive it as an inspiration for us to revive it within ourselves, within our communities, within our households. When we become like them, that's when our ummah is going to be successful and that's inshallah ta'ala when this dhul, this humiliation that the Muslims have been, that's been put upon the Muslims today will be raised from them inshallah ta'ala. ثم اعلموا رحمه الله وياكم أن الله قد أمركم بأمر بدا بي بنفسه ثم ثن بملائكة الكرام فقال عز وجل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا على سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما ويقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من صلى علي بواحد صلى الله عليها بها عشرة اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وعنم على نبينا محمد ورد الله من الخلفاء الراشدين أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وانسائر الصحابة أجمعين اللهم عز الإسلام المسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام المسلمين 
اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين وذل الشرك والمشركين ودمر اللهم أعداك أعداء الدين اللهم أتي نفوسنا تقواها وزكيها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها ربنا إننا ظلمنا أنفسنا ولم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم إننا نسألك أن تكون عونا ومعينا لإخواننا المستضعفين في كل مكان ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وقيموا الصلاة يحمكم الله